Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Great show in store for you. We'll be talking chucker hunting. For the guy who knows a little bit about that subject, Travis Warren, the host of the Upchucker podcast, uh, among other things, avid, lives in the country, and knows his stuff. We'll also cover a whole bunch of other things along those lines, from essential gear to how your dogs ought to be trained. That sort of thing will be coming up on the podcast. Can't get enough of them. Uh, The mystique, the challenges, both physical and mental, the beauty of the surroundings. He should have some insights in all of that, and I am sure looking forward to learning from him, and uh, hopefully you will too. But that's not all. We'll do our first photo feature on this podcast. Yeah, I'm going to do my best to describe some of the pictures you all sent when I asked you what was the most awe-inspiring view you had this season. That ought to be fun. Stick around for that and the Upland Nation puzzler question and prize. It's all made possible by Roughland Performance Kennels. Happy Jack Dog Care Products, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns from Legacy Sports, Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food, and Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School. Your source for your next shotgun. Well, um, I got more to share down the road, but uh, this is a podcast uh, for all of us, not just for me, but did get the chance to end the chucker season where i started great weather unbelievable walking (laughs) a lot of it flat which is kind of nice for a change and um a few quail in the bag let's just leave it at that i'll share more down the road with you as we as we get farther and farther from the end of the season and are looking for more and more ways to kind of get that fix uh hope yours turned out good as well we'll be debriefing on that topic later on as well in another podcast but for right now let's say we've closed the books on it in a very positive way i shot fewer birds this year but i had way more camaraderie and way more peak experiences out there and you think about that for a while because that's really what it's about not the weight of the game bag right yeah all right oh Owen. by the way lots of great dog work we're brought to you in part by sage and breaker gun care products crafted at the highest caliber sage and breaker.com is where you learn all about those uh heirloom quality um cleaning products care products everything from uh gun um cases to cleaning rolls tools and all the other what what we call in the tv business um consumables including clp c l p clean lube protect it's a solvent that infiltrates every surface on a micro level provides that deep cleaning on carbon lead and copper fouling plus it lubes and protects learn more about clp at sageandbreaker.com and learn more about pointer shotguns at legacysports.com lots of exciting new gear there one of the most appealing features they have this year is a youth shotgun so if this is the year you bring somebody else into the hunting fold Think about a youth model. You know, most of the time, it's not the weight of the gun. It's the gun fit that boogers up a youth's beginning hunts. This one has a length of pull of just 12 and a half inches, perfect for small, statured individuals, chambered in 20 or 410, 26-inch barrels, so it balances nicely, all sorts of other accessories. Learn more about the Legacy Sports youth model guns under the pointer label at LegacySports.com You know, I'm a little surprised we haven't talked before and I apologize for that. You'll know what I mean as soon as we get into this thing because we're going to start deep in the weeds. Travis Warren is the founder of 
the Up Chucker podcast. We'll deal a little bit with that. We'll deal with chucker hunting 101 to 401, maybe even in the graduate level. It's a passion we both share. Um, it's an incredible sport. There's a lot to it, multidimensional, and this guy knows his stuff. He lives right on, well, right smack dab in the middle of chucker country. Let's leave it at that. Travis Warren, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Hey, thanks, Scott. Been following you for a while, so I appreciate the opportunity to come on. Well, thank you, and vice versa. You know, it and it's scary. You know, several times I've thought about reaching out to you and saying, "Hey, I'm going to be over here. Any chance you're going to be over here? <laughs> it, it, maybe next year we'll meet at one of those places we don't want to get too specific about out there. But you know, the, the last three years of my hunting career, when not on television, all I've been doing is hunting places i've never been to before primarily for chuckers and it's been a lot of fun and uh, as you well know that puts you in places that most people never get to see tell me how'd you get involved in this whole world uh you know i kind of stumbled across it uh and i mean that in the sense that you know my wife's dad uh raised chucker and pheasant mm. uh, when she was growing up and so for him chucker hunting was a huge part of his life and a huge part of kind of what she, you know, the sort of the world my wife grew up around. And, um, by the time I had entered into my wife's life, that was sort of, uh, something that my, my father didn't really do much anymore. Uh, but he still loved, he loved it and loved to talk about it. And he was the one that really mentored me into, uh, chucker hunting and got me my first shotgun and, uh, which I still use to this day, you know, <laughs> old 870 pump. Um, and, you know, that's really, that's, I mean, I did, I kind of stumbled across it. I didn't really grow up in a, in a hunting family at all. And, uh, when I met my wife, you know, that was a huge part of her dad's, um, just sort of what he did. And so I, I used it, I used that Avenue to gain favor, uh, within him and so that I could eventually marry his daughter and who that, I mean, look where I am at now, it's uh -huh. sort of has grown into my uh, sort of its own beast within, within me and my life. And now my wife and, and my kids' life. So I love I, it. Yeah, it's 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 a funny way. Well, it is, but you're lucky in in two regards. Number one, you had a mentor. I had to stumble around for years and years, looking in the wrong places all the time. Uh, didn't get much of that. Started late in life. It sounds like you started a little later in life as well. But but then you had this perfect excuse to suck up to your future in laws. <laughs> Yeah, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't a huge motivation to actually just get into hunting as it was. Um, you know, I just, it never really was anything that was a part of my life. It's just never something I grew up with. And, uh, and I mean, yeah, it's a huge part of what we do now. And, um, you know, I would say that my father-in-law didn't take me out, but yeah, he yeah. provided the, he provided the, the insight into, you know, how to start looking for birds and, and where to start looking for birds. And, um, and, and that, that's some invaluable information that I still use to this day. And, um, I mean, I, it, invaluable and I, you know, forever grateful because for me, it's, I, I believe that it's definitely improved and enhanced my life to be able to be out exploring and have a reason to do that. Absolutely. I mean, in a lot of ways, we joke about it around here and, and it's the same with fly fishing. I started in this whole outdoor thing with, as a fly fisher and it's simply an excuse. If you were going the places you went without a shotgun or a fly rod in your hand, people would think you were nuts. Yeah. Well, you know, many people drive through checker country, uh, to whatever state that you're in and they look at it and they see that there's nothing or they just, they write it off as a, as a barren wasteland. Um, and it really is, it's those people who venture out into those areas. Uh, they really notice that it's full of life and there's so much biodiversity and there's so much going on. And it's, it becomes almost this, um, almost like this, this bit of a Shangri-La, you know, people discount it, but you realize that you found it. And it's a place that sometimes people hear about, but no one always get to see. And, and I think that chucker hunters get to experience that. And it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, unique group of individuals that do it mostly because of the mindset that goes into it. Uh, and it's, it's just a fun community to be a part of. 
I agree there are some people I'd rather not meet on the Tucker Hills, but that's another story. Maybe we'll de- deal with that later down the road as well. But but you, you hit on something that is absolutely positively true. You know, people look at it and they think it's just, a, like you said, a wasteland. There's so much out there. And uh, and uh, it, it if you don't get down and dirty with it, if you're not up close and personal with that uh, terrain with that habitat then you don't see the petroglyphs and you don't see the pack rat nests and you, you don't see the golden eagles and and that sort of thing what of all of those things and and who knows what else what is the thing that that just keeps drawing you back to chucker country you know i think it's i think it's the fact that i haven't figured it out uh-huh. i think that for me and i and i actually made this analogy uh to a problem. I can't remember who I made this analogy, but I made this analogy this year that I feel like chucker hunting is a lot like golf in the sense that you could be on form one day and everything works and you feel like you got it figured out. And then the next day you can go out and do the exact same thing. And it would be like, you never actually had ever done it before. And I think it's because I haven't solved it. I don't feel like there's a consistency for me at times. Oh yeah. I get excited about going out because I want to unlock the reason why yesterday was better than today or today was better than yesterday or all of those things. It's, it's never a, it's never a guarantee. It's never a hundred percent. And and I think that that for me, it's unfinished in that regard. So that's why I just love to go out there and figure that out or try to figure that out. So I, what I'm hearing Travis is there's hope for me too. Well, I think there's hope for everybody. You know, I think we all know those. I think we all know those uh, those people who go out, and it seems like they have their their finger on the button, and they just they just they're those guys that never seem to miss, uh, never always know where the birds are. And I know that's not always the case. I, I and but it, it it that's what draws me back because you know you when you get into birds and you have those opportunities and the dogs are working fantastic and your shooting's on point uh, and you found a spot that you've never been to before that turns out to be this little honey hole. All those things make up for, for me, some of the most exciting times. And, and I just, you know, you're always looking for that. You're always looking, you're always chasing that dragon's tail, I guess, in a way you're always looking for that same experience, that, that flawless experience of being out there where everything works the way that you at least envision it should you alluded to something that i i want to uh, just explore and share with you for a moment and that is this whole idea that you're always learning something and this was a big season of that for me i was i i talked in the in the opening segment about how i didn't kill as many birds as as i usually do i don't even think i hunted as many days as i i did but I learned a lot and I, and I learned a lot, not, uh, not just about chasing birds and dog work and habitat and terrain and all of that, but I learned a lot about, uh, some of the other dimensions of this sport, uh, in the broadest sense, including I had more peak, uh, social experiences hunting this year than I've had in a long time. Uh, that was kind of cool to me, but the learning experience itself is, is, you know, some people are just cut out for that. That's me. I'm a perpetual student of everything. W- what did you learn this past season that maybe was a revelation? Um, you know, I think one of the things for me that was unique about this season was where to find birds. And we, and that's because this was sort of a more, I guess what you would expect to see for normal winter patterns and normal summer patterns and spring patterns for mm-hmm. weather. Yeah. We had a, we had a, you know, quite a few kind of tsunamis, I guess, in a way, it's a typhoon, you know, a lot of rain that came through. Um, and so what, what you saw is that there's a lot more water out there mm-hmm. than in past years. So I don't necessarily think that for me, at least, you know, you found the birds directly on water because there was other options out there. Um, there was a ton of green up. That was one of the most, I think, significant things about what I saw this year and have seen this year is that there was just green up everywhere. And that's obviously one of the rules. So for me, it was really focusing on where they would find shelter. So 
you know, these rock outcroppings, the, the, the little draws where they could get in out of the wind, places that they would look for shelter seemed for me to be the most consistent place and way to locate birds when the, the, you, they could have been anywhere given the other factors involved in finding birds. So, so, so they basically had all their other needs met. So the number one need that you thought was important was, we'll call it cover. Um, exactly exactly and and, you know every time i tried every time i focused on that i would find birds and so it it was just interesting you know the sort of that process of elimination or reshaping your thought and how things should be and and how you should look for things or how you should evaluate the conditions of the terrain that you're in Uh, instead of just being so focused or stuck in one one pattern of thought Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. actually start to try and evaluate and look through and, and sort of in a way think okay well if all my needs are met what else is a what else is a commonality that i would yeah. need to be able to uh focus on and so it was the shelter and yeah uh, um and then for me as well you know i uh, i switched over to a 20 gauge two barrel last year which was just catastrophic <laughs> and was really really for me I, I it was a very demoralizing transition I'd never shot a 20 gauge before. I never, I had, I shot a two tuber, but you know, the, the going down in the size was, was definitely for me. I think it was more of a mental game. And yeah, yeah. I spent some time this year messing around with different shell combinations, different shell combinations, and, and took that time to sort of pa- pattern and look and see what the gun was doing. Um, and then really focusing less on, shooting but more on quality of shot mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that for me made a huge difference and my and really for me I, my accuracy went up considerably and uh and so i think for me it was the, it was learning to be more patient with my shooting there you go uh, yeah. i think that anybody listening to this who's regardless of whether it's chucker hunting or quail hunting or, or i mean pheasant hunting whatever um i think sometimes you get so caught up in the thrill of the flush that you and sometimes it'll catch you off guard too that you know you tend to shoot faster than Mm -hmm. than you really you than you really should be and you should be taking an extra second to really acquire and and track that gun you know and and or track the bird uh before you shoot so really it's the the patience thing that i learned the most about this year yeah i uh i agree 100 percent. if you if you pattern your gun and you pattern it at say 25 or 30 yards it's very obvious that you know the the pattern is a lot smaller than you think so give it time to open up can't argue that one bit i um i made the switch to two barrels 32 years ago and i'm still figuring that out but uh it, <laughs> that's okay too you know uh, you mentioned this cover thing and here here's what here's my revelation so far for the season and i haven't made the list yet but the one thing that really kind of shocked me is how many times we found chuckers in juniper groves mm, yeah and it, it, granted, it's it's a kind of cover, and it might have been an escape cover. We 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 theorize a lot of times they were chased there by something. But, yeah. but did did you notice that at all? Not this year specifically, yeah. but I've yeah. noticed it in years past. And I mean, when you talk about escape cover, uh, last year last year, I can think of a unique op- I mean, a unique circumstance where that is exactly what they used it for. Yeah. Uh, Actually, I saw that twice. I saw that uh, both in northern Nevada and I saw that in Utah when I was there where they were found. We found them. We got into them exactly where you would expect to get into them on the steep slope uh, in some of that rock cover. And, you know, we got into them the first time and they flew right into the junipers. And then when they were in the junipers, it was incredibly difficult to try and pick up a shooting lane. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and they knew they knew why they were in there. And their their likelihood of survival or escaping whatever threat that was presented to them, it's much it's much higher because trying to you might catch a glimpse of a wing beat, you know, as they flash between one tree and the other. But yeah, I think that though I haven't seen it this year specifically, but I have seen it in years past. And last year was significant in that regard of seeing them use it as an escape cover. Yeah, yeah. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, the host. That's Travis Warren. Uh, I'll just call him a chucker expert. You know him from the Up Chucker podcast, among other things, website of the same name. Um, we're talking about all things devil birds, um, 
we probably have some other names for them we shouldn't use on a family program. But the fact of the matter is, yes, you chase them up and they fly down and the first time is for a fun and after that it is for revenge. There, we got all the cliches out of the way and we're right. sort of warmed up now. Uh, what kind of dogs you're running? I heard a nasty rumor that you might have dogs from a breeder trainer that I work with periodically. Uh, well, I have it. Uh, so I have a six year old GSP yeah. um, and I call her the 50% dog. <laughs> and, and I have, I have an absolute, absolute specimen uh, of a dog. And, I, and I'll just, I'll stay it. I know you're not supposed to necessarily brag about your dogs because they always prove you wrong, but yeah. <laughs> a two year old wire hair out of Wire's West Kennels, which yeah. is Maggie and at a, up there up in Terrebonne, Ida, uh, Oregon. And this dog was, just, she's just so fantastic. She is, she's lights out. And it has imp- vastly improved, and, and I think it also improved the, the just the fun I have out there because I know that if there's birds anywhere near us, she's gonna find them. Yeah, and she'll point them and she'll hold them, and uh, it's it's just it's just a fun. It, it is absolutely the most thrilling experience to see a dog on point. I, it, it it is, and so yeah, I have that I have that two year old wire hair, so I run two dogs and. Uh, it's been a bit of a challenge and yeah. we can get yeah. that too, just getting the two to work together more so the older one to work with the younger one and just sort of understand the dynamics. Uh, but this year we really, I think that's the other thing that's made this year so much more fun is uh, it. They really, we figured it out as a team and that's for me the most enjoyable thing. When, when you say it was a bit of a challenge, I've, I've been there and done that a couple of times over the years with my five wire hairs and, and yeah, it is spectacular when it works. It's, it's a, it's pure cluster when they, when it doesn't work, but what, what, what did you do in your training regimen to get them to kind of get along? I think it's two, for me, it's two things. First and foremost, my oldest dog we had for a number of years before we ever introduced another dog. And mm-hmm. so even in that regard, she never, we hunted a lot alone. Uh, or even when we were with other people, she didn't really have to honor or, uh, I guess, submit to another dog or mm-hmm. another dog being mm-hmm. on point or being respectful, I guess, would be the more the a better way of putting it. Uh, so she was just used to doing her own thing. And when I brought this puppy in, there was a territoriality aspect where she just didn't, you know, this is my home, this is my family, what is, what is, this, what is this thing doing here? Uh, and so they had to learn both themselves to bond uh, on their own level uh, and just be okay with the dynamics of their relationship. Uh, and then a lot of it, as well has just been exposure over the last two years. Fortunately for us and for me, we have a ton of wild quail literally on the backside of my fence. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I run the dogs. We have a little two mile loop that we do. Uh, and there's usually a, a covey or two of quail in there. And so we, I have this opportunity for consistent exposure throughout the year that they have. And so the puppy, pointing and then the dog she's just getting used to seeing another dog on point yeah and yeah. what she's supposed to do and it it took a lot of work too it took a lot of woe training for her uh you know and i have to still overhandle her at times uh, and that's just the dynamics of the relationship that we have to that we sort of abide by at this point she i had to woe her sometimes i'll give her a slight nick if i see her trying to creep in um and so that's sort of how we have developed that relationship. Now, when she sees her on point, she'll slow and she'll stop. And it really just depends. But what we were seeing before is that she would completely disregard the puppy being on point and just absolutely go in and blow the birds mm-hmm. because she doesn't want the puppy to get them. Right. Yeah. And so I'm not, we don't see that anymore. That's not the, the dynamics of the relationship any longer. What I see is that maybe she's not staunch with her, with her honor or her back. Um, you know, she'll flag still, she'll want to go up there, but she, she respects me as the handler. And so I'll woe her and she'll stay there and she won't move until I tell her to move. And so, you know, it's a little bit, maybe, I mean, if you want to consider it cheating a little bit, but you know what, it it works for us. And I don't think it's not a defeatist attitude. I think it's probably about as good as we're going to get. Well, Uh, 
yeah, <laughs> the way you live with it. Most 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 trainers would tell you, oh, you know, uh, uh, an honor is not. It's not an in- instinctive act. It's not a point per se. They're not in the scent cone. It's a it's an obedience challenge. And, yeah, and I, you're I, you just alluded to that. Uh, it and and so you can work on that. Uh, in a different way than if the dog was in the scent cone and they were, you know, the first on the find. It's a different game. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's a good perspective. I think it's a good way of looking at it, too. You know, I think for me, you see other people's dogs, and and sometimes it's a bad reference because you don't know sort of what energy they put into that dog or what breeding that dog came from. And so you sort of have to look and evaluate your own personal situation and also evaluate what it is you're looking for out there everybody's different as to what they consider a favorable experience. And so what happens now generally is the puppy is the one who's going to be working out, you know, 150, 200 yards ahead. Mm -hmm. My older dog stays, she'll stay within a high, within 50 to hundred yards of me. She actually works a lot closer. And if I know she pushes out, she might be into birds. If I try and keep her, within eye shot within within view Mm -hmm. because i don't trust her the way i trust the puppy i can let the puppy go she can be gone she can go out 500 yards which she does at times tracking birds and she'll stay on point if she finds birds and hits a sand cone she'll hit and she'll stay and we had that this year with quail where she tracked quail over 500 yards hit on point and just stood there until we showed up 15 minutes later um but I don't trust the six-year-old. I don't trust my older dog to do that because she just won't. She gets too overwhelmed with if birds start running. So I keep, I'll keep her close. I'll, I'll bring her in and heal her and walk her in to the puppy. And then once I'll let her see the puppy. Mm-hmm. And then once I know that she's seen the puppy and she starts to slow, I'll woe her. Yeah. And make her stay. And then we'll go up. The good, the, 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 really the strong point with the older dog is, and this might be just a testament to what kind of work I did with her. We did a ton of retrieving training when she was a puppy and she absolutely, I believe lives for retrieving. She absolutely loves to retrieve birds. It's, it seems to be the only thing in life she really wants to do. <laughs> which is great. So for her, I kind of treat her like my lab, I guess at this point, there where you go. She'll, point yeah. she'll point birds. And, I mean, she'll find some from time to time, but it's like 50% of the time, whether or not she'll, she'll do it well enough for me to get up there and get a shot. So, but I can guarantee you, and I, I guarantee you that if I shoot a bird, it, we will find it. She well, will find it. She I'm knocking a, wood. Yeah. Re- I, I had that. In fact, I described it again, uh, in the last podcast, how, uh, how, motivated for a wire hair my dog man flick is is so motivated for that and it came from just associating all the preliminaries with the fact that hey if you do all these things right bird in mouth yes are you um are what what do you expect from your dog let's uh let's go into the field your dog hits a point both uh one hits a point the other one honors the point um, who's going to fly the bird? What level of steadiness uh, are you happy with in the chucker world? And uh, what happens after the shot? I am 100% okay. And, and our and our process is you just stay steady to flush. Yeah. So I'm the one that will flush the birds. So they'll go on point. I'll make my approach. The birds will flush. The dogs will release. I'll take the shot. Birds go down or Hopefully they go down, right? <laughs> uh, that that is sort of the dance that we that we dance when we're out there. I don't I don't look for nor do I care for steady to wing shot and fall. Personally, for me, and this is my personal feeling, I think that you'll lose a lot more birds that way if you if you do that. Um, and by the time they get up and they flush and the shot goes down, even by that time, those birds can be quite a ways out there or halfway down the canyon by the time they fall. So I really want those dogs to be marking those birds and knowing where they are so that they can retrieve them. Um, and so that that's what I look for. I look for steady to, steady to flush, uh, and, and that, that's my only requirement of them. It's... Sounds good to me, especially right about now, thinking back on some of those situations myself. 
And that's Travis Warren. I'm Scott Linden. It's the Upland Nation podcast. Travis, put your feet up, relax for about 90 seconds. Uh, we'll be back at you then. We're talking chuckers, chucker hunting, chucker dogs. And maybe we'll come up with some more names for those stinking birds after this. Uh, stick around. We've got a lot more to talk about. I will be talking about, well, I like I said, a photo feature. Yeah, I'm going to do my best to describe some of the incredible pictures you sent me when I asked you to show me your most awe-inspiring moments. So stick around for that. The Upland Nation puzzler question and a prize. It's all coming up very soon. Right after this word about happyjackinc.com. Happyjackinc.com. Not always, but quite often. They've saved me a trip to the veterinarian, especially if it's a minor problem that I can solve right there on the tailgate or at home. If your dog's slowing down, it may not be fatigue. It may be arthritis. Quick and easy test uh, get him some flex enhance plus from happyjackinc.com it contains creatine and glucosamine the same stuff i'm taking and it works on me it'll probably work on your dog as well flex enhance plus go to happyjackinc.com find a nearby retailer or buy it direct at happyjackinc.com and uh, just reconfiguring the rig yet again. Got so many goodies from Rough Land Kennels. Still trying to figure out what the right way to put it all together is. And I'm I'm a lucky guy. Got all the right stuff. Uh, I am uh, uh, number one uh, grateful for um, the the thought that goes into their crates. You know, they were the pioneers in high performance roto molded crates. On top of that, they have not stopped thinking about our needs. If you got an SUV, they've got a way to save some space, give your dog maximum room inside that crate, snug it up against the front seats where it basically locks into place. Take a look at RoughlandKennels.com for all their accessories and their performance crates. And if you're still there with me, Travis Warren, Upchucker Podcast, et cetera, et cetera, let's uh, keep talking about my favorite subject. You there? I am still here, buddy. You haven't lost me. Yeah, cool. Um, you know, uh, it seems like I write a lot about this stuff, and, and one of the things I, I put into almost every sidebar I, I do for a magazine is uh, a little warning, if you will, uh, whether it's hey some of the things out there can bite you scratch you poison you or eat you uh then i put a little list together sometimes it's my 10 essentials sometimes it's something along that lines for the dog or whatever but what what about you what's in your vest that you carry all the time maybe you've learned the hard way uh that we probably haven't thought about well i think one thing for me that's most important uh, that I always carry with me is I always carry a, a tourniquet with windlass. Mm. Um, you know, not, you can carry a SWAT T you can carry d- different kinds, but for me, like uh, having a, an actual real, um, you know, the, the proper kind of, of tourniquet is really important because, you know, catastrophic bleeding, uh, you could fall, you could, you could get gouged by something. Uh, you could, you know, fall on your gunk at discharge. I mean, something something like that could happen. Uh, it's just the nature of where we hunt and, and how we hunt. And uh, you're over difficult terrain with a firearm and, and accidents occur. And so for me, I always carry with me in my bag uh, a tourniquet. Well, let's hope you never have to use it, my friend. That's uh, kind of scary, but I'll never forget uh, down uh, between your house and my house, right about the middle there buddy of mine slipped on some ice and there goes his gun and from Mm. the other side of the canyon i would have sworn on a stack of bibles he'd shot himself in the foot yeah so i raced as fast as i could on the ice to get over there and found out no everything's just fine a little noisy but dodge that bullet do you carry a personal locator beacon or whatever you know a spot or a in reach or anything like that yeah, I upgraded last year to the Alpha 200, so it comes uh-huh, in the yeah. future. 
Yeah. So that was actually funny because uh, that was something that I sort of dreamed about. I thought, man, wouldn't it be great if they put the inReach feature? Because I was looking at buying one. If they put the inReach feature in the damn handheld, and yeah. then lo and behold, uh, they they obviously heard me cursing at the wind about it, and uh, they made one. So I bought one a couple. I bought one two seasons ago, and this will be the second season I use it. So. Uh, it's just nice. It's a, it's just insurance. It's yeah. like it's like the tourniquet. It's insurance. Um, what, what I don't I don't want to be the guy they write about afterwards who uh, said he did the stupid thing and he couldn't get himself back out of that fix. And so that's a, my fear is more of embarrassment than anything else. So I'm going to carry all those things too. Yeah, I mean, I I so what was that? I guess it would have been three seasons ago. I broke down. Uh, out in the desert, I went out by myself. I sort of had a very, uh, I guess, in my wife's mind, a wishy-washy plan as to what was gonna is what my my hunting plan was, and so she just figured I was staying out there, and she kind of misheard me, and so. Um, but my intent, obviously, I was like, oh well, I'll just come back home, and so she she didn't think to look for me. She figured I was out there camping and happier than a, a pig and shit, I guess they say, and uh, and then lo and behold. Uh, my fuel pump went on my truck, which uh, out there you're just not going to fix. <laughs> and so I, I was stranded out there. And eventually, uh, after a cold night in the truck, I had to walk out to the main road and uh, and then try and hitch a ride, which I eventually did. Thank goodness it was clo- it was the weekend before closure, and there was more usually more people out on the road. And somebody came across and gave me a ride to some reception and. More or less, it was just a very inconvenient circumstance, and uh, and just basically killed the rest of my season at that point. Uh, so I, uh, so yeah, that's why I said, you know what, I got to get something that can help me communicate because cell phones don't work out there in Chucker Country for the most part. So mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. need to do something to the at least I could communicate and say, yeah, I broke down, I'll be fine, I'll stay out here tonight, and then I'll work on getting home in the morning. And, and, you know, I'll tell my wife much the same thing. You know, I, I, as long as I, I haven't fallen off a cliff and landed on my head, I'll be okay for a day or two. And by then things should start to work out. But of all the, of, of all of the fixes you've gotten into, um, what is, what is the one lesson you've learned from all of those? Oh, like preparation, you know, uh, preparation is key and, and it's not to sound over, uh, I mean, over paranoid or anything like that. But by the very nature of where we go out and hunt, we are in the middle of nowhere. And we usually a couple hours from any, you know, semblance of a, of a town or, or, or a city or something like that. And so um, sometimes that's by the very nature of what we're designed to do. We want to go out away from people, as far away from people as possible to try and find places where the birds have not been harassed in that you know, nobody will likely stumble across, across us in the event that we do find, you know, that, that one honey hole. Uh, so because we're so far away and removed, you have to be prepared. And that's both being prepared in the vehicle that you drive um, and also being prepared in what you carry along with you mm-hmm. once you leave your vehicle. So preparation, wearing the right clothes, having the right emergency gear with you, and then having back at your truck the ability to actually live, survive, you know, for, you know, a couple days, however long it would take for you to actually get rescued um, and doing it comfortably and confidently that you'll be fine. So preparation for me is has been the, the overwhelming thing that I have taken away from every negative experience or uh, tricky experience that I've had out there. Enough of the uh, scare tactics. Let's talk strategy and tactics. Or, uh, you know, let's have some fun out here. Uh, you know, if you're going to, a, whether you know the place or not, you're you're parked at the bottom of a hill somewhere and you're looking at that hill. Um, what are some of the things you, you look for and plan for? How do you plan that first assault? Um, You know, Diff, two different things before when i didn't have a dog for me i just i would just go to the top uh-huh. um because i felt like at least if i was up top i'd have a better idea of where they were um not always the best strategy but at least that was my strategy before i got dogs now that i have dogs 
Um, I'll start looking for objectives. Like I said, I'll start looking, depending on the year, you know, where is the water located? Uh, where is, you know, where there's some green up? Where's the cover? Uh, where, where, and that was, that's big for this year. And I think that's the big takeaway. So where the cover would be, where the rock outcroppings would be, where is there, you know, depressions uh, in that hillside that birds can get out of the wind or get out of the elements? Where would they be? around you know where would they be sunning themselves is there a nice sunny spot uh what time of year is it is it is it beginning is it early season or is it um late season so where's the burn off for the snow so that that's how i would evaluate where how to start and how to address that quote-unquote problem um that you're faced with you know i in years past i've i i used to believe that all the birds were below the snow line but then i started walking through snow and finding tracks yeah is yeah, that I don't think... that's really kind of an old wives tale isn't it i think i think that it is if so if the snow comes on quickly then those birds are going to be wherever they were nestled up for the night mm -hmm. so if you're looking at a white blanket of snow on a mountainside, those birds could still likely be wherever they were the night before. So that's why looking for that cover with, is probably a good location to go to. Um, if that snow has been there for a considerable amount of time and it's burned off, then, you know, you could probably, you know, it wouldn't hurt to start looking in some of those burn off areas, maybe where the line of snow is, but yeah, I mean, there, I've seen them. I've seen a, a cubby fully excavate a snowy, patch of like a 20 by 20 foot patch of snow yeah to get down so that they could feed there it's not it's it's not a hard fast rule in, in my observation that you look for the snow line any longer because mm -hmm. i mean i you you can try you and you do and you should use s tracking them in the, in the snow as a strategy because they're going to be in that snow it, it's not as as a, a much of a deterrent i think as m most people have been led to believe in years past no, I, I learned that the hard way. We were at the very top of a hill uh, north of where you and I were talking about off mic a while, a while ago. And and I'm walking up. I'm following, you know, as tra pro trackers, I don't care what they're tracking. They don't look right down at your, their feet to follow the footprints of whatever they're tracking. But I was doing that, and I was going around and around this bunch of sage. And I finally said, hey, Dave, I th I think there have been birds up here, and the tracks lead right to. <laughs> there they go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now I, I I stand back a little bit and do that. You know, you you've talked a little bit about water and food, and and I, I, I I'm this much colorblind so green up to me is really kind of almost invisible most of the time i have to really get yeah. down there and look at it uh when we're talking about green up i'm i'm gonna guess you mean um essentially say not say uh, uh cheat grass shoots as they're coming up uh that have germinated from the seeds that fell last year and they're coming up in the fit the fish the the, the chuckers uh and and quail by the way i've killed a lot of quail this year with uh, with uh green in their crops but is that what you're talking about yeah any, i mean really any grasses yeah I mean, they, yeah they could be native I mean, it, really, any grass, any green grass shoots. Um, you know, when they're that early, at least for me, I can't tell the difference between a cheat grass shoot and uh, and just a regular piece of green grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, that, yeah, you're going to find a lot of that, and that happens when there's when there is that moisture in the ground. Yeah, and hopefully, it it comes about the time all the seeds are eaten. Uh, you know, maybe some overlap would be helpful, but I haven't seen much of that. Have you ever found anything else in a, in a chucker's crop that, that surprised you? No, not really. Uh, no, nothing that actually comes to mind. It's just the normal things you would see, you know, you would just see, um, yeah, the green grasses or, or any sort of grass or forbs that they can find. Um, nothing, nothing unique that would make me believe uh, that I should be looking for anything other. I've heard rumors of other things, um, you know, of like wild garlic, wild onions and, and their crops, and they smell really strongly like that. Hmm. Uh, but I haven't experienced that myself. Yeah, I found uh, many years ago in, in a, a really bad snow year, I, I actually found some sage 
brush leaves and a couple birds, but that's about it. I'm, I'm like you, and I've never found any other seeds besides cheatgrass. Interesting, though, those, those seeds are, are on the ground a lot longer than we think. And again, if you get down and you look on the ground, even, you know, late season, you can find them there. And, and if you don't find them there, you find them in the birds if you ever get lucky and shoot one or two. Um, yeah, when you, you talked earlier about the juniper bushes too. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things with them is that, you know, when especially when there's snow, they can sit underneath those trees and they can still forage for grasses and seeds and stuff like that. And I think that's sometimes why you find them, especially when there's a heavy snow yeah. underneath those juniper trees. Um, I'll never forget. I was I was filling the truck tank at a wide spot in the road in the places where we hang out you and me and the old timer on the other side of the island of the uh gas station post office cafe motel general store um <laughs> said how are you having any luck and i said yeah not as much as we c- could be having and uh, he said well go to that creek at this time and the birds will be coming off that slope down to the creek Hmm. And son of a gun, if it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've been back to that creek a dozen times since, and they've never been there at the same time. So apparently he right. only sent the memo that day. But but do, do, you, do you find most birds coming to water early in the season on a regular basis? You know what? I, I guess for me, I, I can't sit still long enough Yeah, yeah. To stay around a watering hole for that long. For me, the way that I'm hunting, I usually get there right as the sun's coming up, and I'm just going for it. Um, so I usually have a window of time that I can hunt. So for me, I just I just try and maximize it. What I will tell you, which I was incredibly – just made me laugh this year, um, was that I did – I did just that. I actually, it was a spot that I found close to home. And I, you know, this is between eight o'clock when I dropped the kids off at school and two 30 when I have to go pick them up. So I went to this spot and I immediately right off a Creek and I immediately just went to the top and started working the ridge line. And I came across a, a fresh roost. I mean, a fresh roost and I, the dogs were working around and, and I mean, you could tell that they could smell birds, but we never found them. So we kept and we worked our way across and we came up onto this next slope and we got into a covey of birds and got a couple of birds and, and started looking at the watch and was like, okay, well, I guess it's time. And this is about one o'clock in the afternoon. So I drop all the way down to the Creek bottom and it's, it was about a, you know, mile stretch to get back to the truck. And so I said, well, I'll just, I'll walk it out. Maybe I'll kick up some quail or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we, hike it out and it was about one o'clock in the afternoon and next thing you know the dogs disappear into this big bush and i can see about 25 chucker shoot out the other side (laughs) and i and i thought to myself i just start laughing i'm like what are the odds i mean so many times have i done that where you know you go and you do these massive hikes and you come back and they're like you know a couple hundred yards from the truck yeah and right off the water and and that for for me was a, I'd never really seen them on the water or right there. I always kind of surmised that why wouldn't they be here? Uh, but I'd never actually seen them down that low or on that water ever. I'd seen some quail, and that's kind of what led me to that area in the first place. Well, in 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 true uh, valley quail in particular, um, I've seen that more that that very creek. I can almost always find valley quail down in the creek bottom. But these chuckers, yeah. they were lined up and they were hopping off that first one foot drop to the next drop to the like in line. <laughs> well, they know, they know the strategy. It's 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 Much hilarious. Deep. Yeah, yeah. And I'll often hunt toward or away from a water source. Not I won't mm-hmm. stake it out. That's kind of weird. And and I'm like you, I can't stand still. Plus, the dogs won't stand for it either. You know, if you had to. Um, <clears throat> Tell us there's one thing we should do more of when we're when we're learning how to hunt chuckers. What would it be? I think stopping and listening. I think that still for me, I hunted for quite a few years without a dog. And so I started, you know, you, you have to learn different strategies in locating birds. And one of the strategies that I always, uh, that I really picked up early was just listening. Because 
you know, they may not be, they might not be very vocal early in the morning, but they might start getting vocal in the, in the afternoon, uh, in the early, in the later morning. And even to this day, uh, I will, especially, it's hard to hear birds when your dogs are panting next to you. Uh, so I'll constantly like tell them, get out of here. Go. I can't hear, get out of here. And they think, Oh, we're just stopped for a break. And it's like, no, leave. I'm trying to listen. So I, I really try. I really still do stop and listen because that will help you locate birds. It might seem like if you have dogs, you don't need to do that, but you might, they might just be on a different hillside, but you can hear them. And, and it might be very, very faint, but it's enough to make you maybe push another hundred yards to, to confirm if, if you heard what you heard and then shoot off in that direction. And, yeah. and so I think yeah. that's a, I think that's a really important strategy that we need to remember is just to stop and listen and see if you can elicit a response or see if you can hear them calling to each other. And that will give you an opportunity to start narrowing down your, your sort of your search grid, I guess. There you go. Uh, how about your dog's feet? You do anything special to keep those pads in shape? I just run them on, I just run them on good old fashioned chucker country all year mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't do anything to their feet. Their feet are, are pretty, pretty robust. Um, they'll get a couple of abrasions here and there, but, I don't, we don't have foot issues. You're a lucky guy. <laughs> I am. A very, I'm a very lucky guy. And I just, you know, I live obviously in the same, in, in the same terrain. And so, you know, we, we hike all over the place. Uh, and it just, it helps a lot just to keep their feet up to snuff. Oh yeah. That's Travis Warren. I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast, all things chuckers today. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, you bring home a chucker or a bag full of chuckers and, um, um, you're going to cook them somehow. What, what, what way are you going to cook them that we can all figure out how to do pretty easily? I think the easiest thing you can do is, is, is just to stick them all in a crock pot yeah. and just cook down. And then you could just pull all that meat off. It'll just be like shredded pork or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could pull all that meat off and then you just substitute it for whatever it is that you would want to use. It's super easy to use as a meat. Uh, meat additive for a pasta. Mm -hmm. um, I one of the most favorite things that we make here is chucker enchiladas. Olay. So instead of uh, shredded beef or shredded chicken, we just use shredded uh, chucker. Uh, we do a green chili sauce and a red sauce. Uh, so there's some variety, and and it, the kids love it. Yeah, that's how you introduce people to hunting through their stomachs. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to argue if you've had a good experience with the food and uh, that it's it's not something that, that is delicious. Um, you know, generally, I won't even, I mean, it, it's no mystery if you come to my house and you have dinner that you might have some wild game in your dinner. So uh, I just think that people maybe come to expect it. And I think it's a kind of an exciting thing, too, because I think birds are, birds have they don't really have much different of a taste from maybe what you're used to if you buy a chicken mm -hmm. uh, so it, i don't think for people it's it's an eve factor uh it's like oh well i've had a cornish game hen before well it, it i mean there you go it's it's there's not a ton of difference organic sustainable wild caught yeah. well wild caught <laughs> yes, definitely definitely uh not you're not there's no um you're you're losing money every time so <laughs> if it's if it's a pure financial decision just go buy a chicken at the store if yeah you want a story to go along with your meal it's 100 percent, i believe more enjoyable and, and i think i get a lot more out of the entirety of the experience of cooking and presenting and and heart and getting it and going out and shooting them and getting them Amen. That's the, you know, the, that's on the short list of other TV series to develop, uh, is a field, field to feast with yeah. em emphasis on the feast. So we can share all of that other stuff as well. I love that. Um, you're shooting a 20 gauge these days. So welcome to the club. Um, yeah. what's your typical gauge? I mean, your typical load and what kind of choke, uh, tubes have you got in there most of the time for chuckers? So uh, this is this was the big change and the big uh, uh, adjustment I made, which mm -hmm. for me I 
directly goes into my accuracy level going up. A conversation I had with my buddy, uh, Gerhardt Stevenson. I don't know if you've ever run across him before, but he is just a, just an absolute, he's, he's my guru when it comes to shotguns and loads and all those sorts of things. He, uh, we talked at ad nauseum about the, the, the perfect chucker shell. And he is, he, his belief, he's dead set on, if you can find seven and a half, that is mm-hmm. the best mm-hmm. chucker load you can find. And so I, I made that switch. I went actually, what I do, what I did go to this year is I, I shoot the boss shot shell three inch number seven, sorry, number, uh, yes, number seven. So, and that's, an, that's a bismuth. So it probably equates to closer to an eight, but the pattern density on that shell is, is fantastic. I mean, it, it really knocks them down. And I, I, my accuracy has just gone up incredibly. I think sometimes when you when you shoot a six or even a five, there's so many holes in your pattern that sometimes those birds just get away because well, it just is unfortunate. So oh, I hear you. I know you're absolutely right. Uh, I shoot a seven and a half almost all season for that very reason. Um, you 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 went over to non toxic all the time. Yeah. And that really was more more or less because I just couldn't find any shells. Yeah. Uh, and Boss was the only one who was consistently uh, had shells available. And so I had shot some last year, uh, and I sort of had a so-so experience with them, and I, I wasn't completely sold. Uh, but when it was coming up to the season and I needed shells, I knew that, well, they were the only ones that, that sold them. And a buddy of mine, Levi Day, actually had bought those same shells and had recommended them. So I said, yeah, you know what? It's worth a shot. If I don't like them, I could, you know, what, whatever, you can never have too many shotgun shells anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, so I ended up, that's what I ended up going with is, um, uh, is going with boss merely because they were available. Yeah. And yeah. I do like to go to California and hunt as well. And you have to shoot non-toxic over there. And so yeah. it was much easier just to have one shell to be able to go anywhere you want with. And so, it made uh, yeah, so that's just what I went with. I did pick up a couple of uh, two and three quarter inch, uh, seven and a halfs from a buddy of mine who had some sh- extra shells. I got a couple boxes from him, uh, so I have shot those two and three quarter inch, uh, seven and a halfs, which I done pretty well. And it's amazing actually how much they don't kick. Uh, ah. There's not that much of a recoil. Or <laughs> it's uh, it's it's actually it's uh, it was amazing to me, and I know it should. It's not amazing to people who have done it before and who do it consistently with shooting seven and a half um, and two and three quarter inch shells. But for me, it was like, wow, I was so stuck in my ways with thinking that I had to shoot a number six for Chucker that moving away from that was was a was a an unsettling thought. But once I made the switch and I realized that actually my accuracy and my bird count went up, I mean, obviously, I, it, it's a no brainer at this point. You know, all you got to do is go uh, go to a range and shoot at the pattern board a little bit, and, and all those things become crystal clear. Now, if only somebody would make a six and a half, that's the ideal pellet size for me, at least until I start shooting it, and then I'll let you know. But that, I think, would be the answer to almost all of these problems <laughs> once in a while. Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, just switching, I mean, if you think about it, going from a seven and a half to a six. It doesn't matter if you're going from seven eighths of an ounce or even an, uh, an ounce and an eight. You're the the difference in pellet number is is over a hundred pellets. Yeah. So I mean, you're you're already in, you're putting in another hundred pellets into your shot pattern. I mean, that's got to say something, and and it does. I mean, it creates a, a denser pattern for you to shoot for for that bird to have to try and fly through, which in my experience this year doesn't work very well. Well, you mentioned denser pattern. We talked about patterning. You haven't told me what kind of choke tubes you're using, what uh, constriction you're using. Yeah, I shoot a double modified. So I shoot modified, modified in both barrels. No kidding. So you got to count to three before you pull the trigger. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, you know, it's I I ha, I will tell you right now that with the, even with going up to that seven, going to the seven, seven and a half, um, even close range shots. You know, you're not blowing birds away either. Yeah, yeah. And I and I shoot that same shell with quail, and you know, I'm not blowing my quail away either. So, um, you know, those birds will go down, and there'll be multiple pellets in them, but they're not destroyed. 
There you have it. This guy knows his stuff. Travis Warren, the host of the Upchucker podcast. You can find more out, find out more about him. At, what's the uh, what's the website address, Travin, Travis? Yeah, yeah, it's upchucker.com. So U-P-C-H-U-K-A-R, upchucker.com. Well, we're just, you know, we could talk all day, but I'm going to turn you loose for more important stuff. But it's been a lot of fun and enlightening for me, I'm sure, for everybody else here at the Upland Nation podcast. Hey, someday we will run into each other out there in the middle of nowhere, and um, I'm looking forward to it. In the meantime, thanks so much for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Well, thanks for the chance. I appreciate it, Scott. You have a good day, buddy. You too. We've got a lot much. What do we have? We have a lot more to talk about. That's what we have here at the Upland Nation podcast, including that new Upland Nation puzzler, a chance at the prize, and your photo feature. Yeah, we're going to share some great pictures that are up on the Facebook page. So if you can't envision them, and if I'm not a very good describer of them, you can always check them out right there. First, uh, Dr. Tim's natural performance dog food has been with us for a long time for good reason. That's what Flick eats. He uses the momentum formulation. It's a little high in protein, a little bit high in fat, but this guy works his butt off. He'll do, you know, on a given day, 25 miles in the field, when we're, especially when we're chasing chuckers. So he needs to put his weight back on this off season, and that's one way to do it. There's real critical factors to getting your dog back into condition after a long, hard season. One is the protein quality and source. Dr. Tim Hunt will explain all that to you on his website, D-R-T-I-M-S. And while you're there, you'll get 30% off your first order. Use the code Upland Nation. Free delivery, D-R-T-I-M-S dot com. And if you're shopping for a new shotgun and you're looking at the Browning A5 as one of your choices, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School might be the place to find it. Mid-Valley Clays clays.com is their address they've got a full line of shotguns for sale and the expertise that comes from shooting champions and qualified instructors who know how to put you into the right gun with the right features browning a5 is a a kind of a legend but now it's got some improvements that you may be interested in whether you're using it for your primary gun or for the whole family, for everybody to learn on, they've now got Speed Load Plus, a nickel Teflon coating, stock shims, and back boring technology. Those are just some of the features that might interest you in a new A5 from Browning. Get all the details and talk to Dave Fiedler at midvalleyclays.com. Oh, I am so looking forward to this because, uh, you know, I feel like I'm going on your hunting trips when when I ask you to tell tell me a little bit and tell everybody else on the Facebook pages how you're doing and what you're doing. So the question was, what was the most awe-inspiring view you had this season? And I shared one of my own. This was from a place, well, we were talking about just a few minutes ago with Travis, uh, my buddy Dave and his Labrador uh, buster up above the clouds on a rocky piece of ground where we had just dropped a couple quail out of a big covey hanging out at the top there. It's kind of a you know, kind of a magical place and a magical scene with that cloud cover below us dog and buddy in the foreground eric lowacker shares a shot of what i think is one of his children with a pheasant in his or her hand i can't tell she's so bundled up he's so bundled up whatever beautiful shot anyway love to see a smile on a kid's face out there in a field karen foot shows us i bet it was a grouse hunt because there's snow on the ground and there's an incredible sun uh right in the little wedge between two conifer trees just as if it's rising off the branches there david katowski shares a shot of his beautiful ticked short hair posing on the top of a hill somewhere he says near vale colorado 
Kent Baxter has a picture of himself in some chucker hills. It looks a little familiar, uh, mainly because the angle of the slope is about 50%. Yow. Ismael Molina, that's an incredible, that you ought to enlarge that picture and put it on the wall. It is foregrounds with some sort of grain, a uh, big field of grain, but the grain heads are lit in a way that it almost looks like a painting by Van Gogh. Yeah, I'm married to an artist. I can say it that way. Beautiful shot. Couple hunters in the background, silhouetted against the sky. Beautiful shot. Speaking of beautiful shots, there's one. Yeah, I think I know that mountain range, Richard Rogers, with some Simpsons uh, opening segment, blue sky and clouds in in the top of it. It's cool. So is Michael Gill's shot of, I'm going to guess, I think that's Mount Hood from somewhere in the east, Michael. That that looks like a Jerry Schur painting. If you're not old enough to remember Jerry Schur, look him up. Michael's got it down pat. It's one isolated mountain peak in the foreground, volcanic landscape. Behind the mountain, an incredible sunrise or sunset of oranges, reds. Oh, thank you, George, for your beautiful uh, sharp tail country shot of a grasslands and rolling hills jason carter way to go my friend good to see you out there chasing something other than upland birds camoed up holding a whole stringer full of uh geese and ducks uh, both you and your buddy there keep up the good work uh you know there's so many here including one that i'm uh, i love brent pike uh thank you brent you're in the You're in the pilot seat. Now that I see that, it looks like a small plane with a single seater, probably a tail dragger. Now that I think about it, if there's only one guy up there and going somewhere for big adventure. And then David DeSmither, you show me a pile of droppings like that. The first thing you've got to do by private message is send me the latitude and the longitude. And okay, one more. The Judith River in Montana. Bruce Wondrack shows us a pheasant hunt, uh, all the fall colors, old cottonwoods, rain, you know, kind of craggy, some of them bare, some of them with one or two branches that still have those golden leaves on them, all coming up out of a beautiful. You can just hear the leaves crunch when you're walking in that cover underneath those cottonwoods. And hopefully, there's a flushing bird real soon hey good job everybody you are all photographers extraordinaire thank you for sharing those uh we got more of that kind of stuff to come but now it's time for the um (laughs) the upland nation puzzler question and a crack a a crack at that comfort series signature series comfort collar from my personal stash you can't buy it anymore but i'm giving one away if you have the answer to this question message me on facebook look it up if you have to i don't mind this is an open book test Uh, just send me the correct answer and maybe you'll learn something as well which of the shotgun barrel diameters is measured in caliber not gauge yeah you know you got 12 gauge you got 28 gauge you got some others in there which of those is not a gauge but is a caliber instead good luck and that all was brought to you by fine birding bird hunting spots.com i got new material every week out there to help you find places to hunt among other things i'm also doing a lot of profiles of some of the dogs i've worked with on the tv show that just wowed me in one way or shape or form so if you're looking for inspiration during the off season check it all out at find bird hunting spots Dot com. Well, if you enjoyed the podcast, uh, tell your friends, uh, rate or review us, Upland Nation Podcast, uh, anywhere you are getting your podcast services, I'd appreciate a review. Thank you to all of you who have left ratings and reviews, including Outdoorsman81. Very kind words. Appreciate that very much. I'll leave you with this. Uh, Charlotte Gray, author and uh, philosopher, obviously, says a dog desires affection more than its dinner. Well, 
almost. Sort of true, Charlotte. Sort of true. Well, I hope you're having a great off season. I know I am. We'll be back here talking about what we did this past season and all the things we hope to do next season and all the things we're going to do in between at the Upland Nation podcast a week from now. I hope you'll join me. In the meanwhile, maybe I'll see you in the training field. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening.